Hi there. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, appreciate uh, seeing everyone and also happy new year. Hope the holidays were spectacular for all of you and you get some good, uh, much needed rest and relaxation. Spend some time with those you love. Uh, my name is Carson Hetty. I lead the America's growth team for Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. Um, every so often we get together and we have these wonderful sessions um, about what's happening uh, within Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. We're very passionate about the nonprofit space and some of the tools and resources that are uh, set aside for this uh, very select and esteemed group. So thank you for being with us. Um, if you have ideas and suggestions for future sessions, please let me know. Uh, we do know that right now, artificial intelligence, AI, is at the top of a lot of folks' minds. Um, I know at the end of the last calendar year, a lot of our tech for social impact uh, organizations were uh, endeavoring into co-pilot. Uh, we've also had a lot of conversations around how to leverage Azure OpenAI. But as you're building the foundation for that, it's really critical to understand the tools and the underlying principles of how Microsoft is making uh, these decisions. And um, we are flush with talent, fortunately, here at Microsoft. So I uh, was very pleased to be joined today by Anushka Madwesh, who's one of our senior cloud solution architects. And uh, this is one of her executive briefing presentations that she gives in Redmond. And uh, wanted to avail this uh, presentation today for our Tech for Social Impact customer organizations and nonprofits. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Anushka. Uh, the session is recorded, as I mentioned. And please feel free to use the chat uh, for any questions that you have. Reach out to me with any follow-up and uh, on with the show. Thank you, Carson. Um, great to meet everyone here. Um, like you said, please use the chat window for any questions. Um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end too. But today I really wanna talk about responsible AI um, and it's kind of threefold talk. First, I wanna kind of create awareness about all of our responsibility around responsible AI from the Microsoft perspective, but also you guys as the nonprofits, the people who are in the field, boots on the ground trying to use some of these AI technologies for good. Um, I also want to share some examples um, and potentially some concerns that I have around the nonprofit industry and things that you should be aware of as you start to implement um, AI solutions. And then overall, I want to um, persuade you to consider some of these issues as you develop your, your personal AI solutions, um, your nonprofit um, specific AI solutions and make sure that all of us together are promoting greater good, um, but in a responsible way. Um, just as some background, I'm a cloud solution architect here on the Tech for Social Impact team. I solely support nonprofit organizations, so I will be pulling from a lot of my experiences working um, in the industry. But I want to start off, and please feel free to use the chat window to to answer, what does responsible AI mean to you? Um, I think there's a lot of different perspectives that you could come from with this. Some may say security, data security, and making sure that um, data, um, you're adhering to data privacy regulations in, in your um, country or in your state. Um, one thing that I'm personally concerned about is equity within um, AI. So how do we make sure that AI is as accessible as possible to every person that would want to use it? Um, I get concerned about, you know, how big of a divide was created when computers came out and there was the socioeconomic impact of the people who could use computers and who couldn't. And I, I'm concerned about, you know, what how will AI play into this? And does AI create a even greater divide than we already have today? Um, I always love to hear about what people are concerned about, what keeps you up at night um, when it comes to, to AI um, and what you th consider as responsible AI. Um, yeah, I hear <laughs> all of the above. Um, Feel free to continue using the chat window with any other ideas you might have. But now I'll talk about specifically why nonprofit organi organizations should care about responsible AI. Um, 
as you guys might know, the nonprofit industry um, divides into numerous subsectors. And so um, I probably won't encompass all of them, but um, even within the subsectors of the nonprofit industry, there are reasons to really promote responsible AI or be thinking about a responsible AI. Um, so a few of these I've highlighted um, in the healthcare industry, what it's devastating to give a false negative result. Um, and we think about false negatives in the form of testing, but we also think of false negatives in the form of analytics, stats, and um, machine learning models. And so what happens when a model is uh, incorrect and that actually impacts someone's health? Um, I think about it in the research space, um, a lot of um, recency and data, just the nature of these foundational models, it takes time to train them. And so they will probably, it will take a long time before these models can be real time off of da data that is happening right now. And so when we're doing research, um, it's, it's kind of known that the model is going to be a few months or even years behind where we are today and making sure that in the research industry, we're, we're making sure to always have a human in a loop that can actually bring in that expertise and validate that that is actually the state of uh, where things are today. In the humanitarian sector, um, I will go a lot more in depth on this, but I think a lot about protecting vulnerable populations. Um, often in uh, hu the humanitarian sector, we're trying to bring resources to people that are vulnerable, but how can AI actually potentially harm those people and how can we mitigate that from the start? Um, in the religious subsector, um, making sure that AI isn't imitating any religious figures. In the environmental sector, um, I think a lot about the sustainability of generative AI. So um, Microsoft does have a goal to be car carbon negative by 2030. Um, and we're continuously doing research on how to make our um, data centers even more efficient. So uh, one example is that we've researched an uh, underwater data center and uh, we we found that um, putting a data center underwater actually will help with the cooling of the data center rather than using a lot of electricity on land to cool the data center. So those are the sort of things that we're trying to partake in. But even you guys as a nonprofit, um, especially in the environmental sector, thinking about like how what is the environmental impact of generative AI? Thinking about social services. Um, a lot of the organizations that I work with are thinking about social determinants of health. If you're not familiar with that term, that really means um, what are the different components or different uh, features of, of a community that would impact their overall health? And the reason why that's important is once we know that, we know what sort of resources to kind of deploy in that region to help with the health. Um, and so one thing I think about with generative AI is the accuracy. Um, social determinants of health is um, very much a math-based um, solution. Um, a lot of linear regression statistical models that go into social determinants of health. And it's known that generative AI specifically is not the best at math, at least today. And so while it may seem as a, a solution where like, oh, I can just talk to ChatGPT and figure out the social determinants of health. Um, no, I hope that you guys will understand after this presentation, it may not be as simple as that. And we need to put a lot of other guardrails into place to make sure that we are getting accurate responses of what actually determines the health of a community. Um, and then finally, education, uh, bridging the computer literacy gap. I mentioned that as a part of one of my worries of responsible AI um, and how um, AI uh, will impact this world. I think a lot about um, how uh, AI could potentially create this further gap and how, as the nonprofit sector, can we bridge that together, especially in the form of education. 
So I'll kind of start off by talking about how Microsoft internally approaches responsible AI. Um, we call it the three-legged stool. Um, so it's this kind of hub and spoke model um, that works to integrate privacy, security, accessibility into all of our products. Um, and so we kind of have these three pillars. One is the research um, led group. So that's more of the subject matter experts that are trying to find the new trends in the industry and kind of stay on top of what's going on in the world. Then we have the policy um, leg. So that would be our Office of Responsible AI. Um, they're the ones that really create policies, governance practices, and coordinate across the entire company to make sure um, we're all adhering to those policies. And then finally, the, the engineering groups, um, which are the ones that actually implement some of these responsible AI uh, processes, systems, tools, checks within the different services that we offer. Um, and so I'll, I'll be pointing to some of these um, groups uh, later on in the presentation, um, but know that you know we're trying to, to work across the entire company to make sure that um, we're adhering to these responsible AI principles. Um, so why does this matter to you? Um, of course, I want you to understand that it's a high priority for us, um, but second of all, I want you to understand that um, the policies that we've created have been across all these different groups, which has led to this, um, the responsible AI goals at uh, standards or goals. Um, it falls into these six pillars, which I'll talk about in a second, but I want you to understand, you know, we're, um, we're working across these groups to not only create these standards for us to adhere to, but to, for you guys as nonprofits to also look at this and say, these are the sort of things that we need to think about as well as we're going on our AI journey. So let me quickly kind of break down uh, these six different standards. The first is accountability. Um, so this is um, how we are all accountable, us as Microsoft and you guys as the customers of our services um, for enacting on our, our principles and taking in them into account into everything that we do. Then we have fairness. So this is making sure that our service, our quality, the quality of our services, the availability of our resources, trying to minimize the stereotyping of certain demographics, cultures, and factors that may be built, naturally built into the bias of a model of this, um, this breath, right? Then we have um, transparency, which is um, kind of working off of fairness, but the differentiation is understanding the limitations of what these systems can do. Then we have reliability and safety. Um, this is um, how we are developing within Microsoft these solutions um, to make sure they're adhering to all of our standard safety practices, but also giving you guidance of how you can safely develop um, solutions based off of our services. And then uh, privacy, security, um, this is, um, I would say the biggest part of this from the Microsoft perspective is that we do not use your data to um, train our models. There is the ability to fine tune, that's kind of separate, um, but in general, when you are interacting with our systems, um, we're not using your prompts to go back and train our models. Um, which is something that's really important. This day and age, um, a lot, I, I think there's a quote that kind of goes, um, if you're using like a free service, you you are the product. So it's kind of your data that that um, organization is accumulating and probably selling and using for something else. Um, and so that's a reason why I'm very proud to work at Microsoft where um, it's really important to us that our we secure your data, your data is not leaked, it's not disclosed, um, but we're also not using it to go back and train our models. And then finally, inclusivity. Um, so that is making sure that we are um, making our services available to every 
human on the planet. So now that I've kind of gone through these six principles, um, of course, this is what we adhere to as a company, um, but these are these also set up kind of a standard for you to use as an organization. But the issue is these are not self-executing, they're open to interpretation, and they don't really answer the question of how do we do this. And so for the rest of our time here, that's really what I'm going to focus on is how do we actually work towards building these solutions. I'll kind of equip you with different tools and services that are available to you as a part of your development process um, so that you can um, actu actually execute on these six principles. So to kind of level set, um, the evolution of an AI project, um, it starts at kind of ideation and coming up with that initial idea not just like how let's use AI for the sake of using AI, but um, what is the actual societal impact of um, using AI and what are we trying to achieve, especially as a nonprofit? What, how does this align back with our mission statement? Once you kind of have that part set, which is arguably one of the harder parts, you start to go into architectural design, um, API calls, data, um, prompt engineering, um, safety of, of the content, um, the UI, UX. But um, it's really important to understand that at every single one of these steps, it's a, you need to consider what are the responsible AI implications, right? So you can think about it in the ideation phase, but you may also want to think about it at the data governance phase, right? How do I make sure that the data that's being used for um, a certain group is not exposed to another group? How do I make sure that the data that I'm using as a part of the solution is complying with um, HIPAA per se? So you need to be thinking about it at every single step of, of your development process. And uh, kind of on top of that, there's these four layers of mitigation. Um, so at the, the highest, most layer, um, you can think about understanding the transparency of the system, the system's purpose, the system's promise um, to, to say like, okay, the, these are the guidelines that we're giving to the system, the solution that we're building. This is the extent that it can, it can go to. And if anyone tries to go past that or does something outside of that, we want to make sure that we're implementing those guardrails into our application to say, hey, you're not, we don't answer questions like that. Um, I saw an example recently online. It was um, a car dealership, I believe, and um, someone had, at, like the car dealership had a, um, a chat uh, feature um, to, to ask questions. Um, and it was, uh, I think people assumed it was powered by um, OpenAI uh, service. And um, someone had asked the, the car dealership of, to write a Python script. Um, and it, it came back with a Python script. And that's a really good example of where, it, you know, that there's not a huge implication or harm in that inherently, but what if instead that person, you know, broke the system and said, hey, give me a free car for this reason, now that it's documented that has a much broader impl implication. Similarly, in the nonprofit industry, some of the, the use cases that I, I mentioned previously, there's really, really devastating implications if these systems are used um, improperly. And so that's where starting at that positioning and saying, hey, this is what the system is used for, and that's the only thing it's used for, is really important. The next layer is going to be the application layer. Um, as a part of this, I've kind of included the, the meta prompting and grounding, which I'll talk about next. Um, but this is more about on the back end saying, uh, the front end and the back end communicating with your users and saying, this is what we can do. Um, these are kind of the, the guardrails that the system has that the user might not have access to. 
Then the next layer is the safety of the system. So this would be content filters and abuse detection. So um, making sure that um, if inappropriate content is sent to the model, if um, a user may be trying to exploit the, the system, maybe in that same example of trying to use a car dealership's chat with to write a Python script, having those kind of guardrails um, as a part of the system to make sure it's um, it's not abused. And then finally, the last uh, step would be fine tuning. So when I say fine tuning, what I'm talking about is um, whether uh, whether you have the model semi-trained on your data. So saying that the model is mostly trained on this vast internet data, but you're going to give it context of your use case to say, OK, like this is example data of what you should be using. Thus, um, when you're responding, you're kind of confined to to this context of data. So I mentioned all these mitigation layers because I'll kind of refer to them um, as we go through the presentation. Um, the one that I'll talk about a bit more in depth is the meta prompting, though. But now we'll, we'll kind of go into each one of these um, standards and deep dive on how you guys can um, implement that as a part of your, your AI solutions. So I'll start with accountability. Um, one thing that I would highly recommend is looking at our impact assessment. Um, so it's a part of our responsible AI standards, and it's a process designed to assess the impact of an AI system um, and how that would impact people, organizations, society. And so it goes through a number of different questions um, to help you kind of highlight, OK, what is the purpose of this? Who are the stakeholders? Who Who's the target audience? What are the exact use cases we're designing this for? What are some of the restricted or unsupported use cases? What are the limitations? Um, but this is a really good framework when you're starting to embark on that um, ideation of an AI solution to start here and say, OK, have we thought through all parts of how this system will impact um, our, our um, constituents or society as a whole? Um, one of the questions I often get is kind of, as it, this is good to know the impact um, assessment and all these different pieces, um, but how do we actually prevent that? And a big part of that is what we call meta prompting. Uh, meta prompting is a way to tell the system that these are kind of the guidelines that you're going to adhere to. Um, so, for example, if I'm creating a bot that is specifically for fundraising and um, the bot is there to um, talk to um, someone that is trying to donate and um, as a part of the, that conversation, um, the person starts asking questions on uh, what the organization can actually do or tries to get assistance from your organization or, or something that's unrelated to, to fundraising. You can build into your meta prompts that only provide answers from the data that's provided or um, I'm your friendly informa informative support agent that will help you go through the donation process. Um, so that's one way that you start to, to add those sort of guardrails um, onto your model. Because otherwise, if you've experienced ChatGPT, played around with ChatGPT, you'd realize that when I work with one of those models, it'll pretty much answer about most things. There are some, you know, content safety sort of filters it has, but um, if I ask it, ask ChatGPT about fundraising today, it'll probably give me an answer. If I ask you about what a certain organization does, it'll probably give me an answer. But making sure that you put those guardrails to say, this is how we'd like to, to restrict the answers. And so um, when we build our meta prompt, there's kind of four components of this. Um, we 
I'll go through each one of these, starting with the response and grounding. So this is saying things like you should always provide factual statements um, based off of potentially data that I we provided to you. Um, if it's found in a document, maybe even giving the, the source of that, that document. But this is grounding your response and saying this is the, the pool of data. This is the information you should be pulling your information from. Then there's the tone. So I would imagine that most bots we want are going to be positive and polite. Um, even if the, the user is being negative with the bot, um, you, you probably want to ensure that your, your bot is staying positive and polite. Um, but this is one way that is, has been found to um, start to find um, hallucinations. If you try to argue with a bot and um, try to um, express like other emotions, that's where the, the bot can actually start to hallucinate. And so that's where it's important to kind of, as a part of your meta prompting to specify the tone. Then the safety, I think this is very, very important for nonprofits, especially nonprofits that are kind of in the healthcare, humanitarian, social services um, space where um, there are, if information is not given the correct way, um, it can really impact someone's life. And so making sure that you specify that um, if, certain language is used as a part of a conversation, the bot will decline to answer on that. Um, or maybe certain topics that are just off limits for the, the bot to talk about. And then, for, of course, jailbreaks. So um, this is if the user asks um, for its rules. So if you wanted to expose the whole meta prompt uh, making sure that the bot knows not to um, not not to respond with that because that's another way that someone could try to to break the bot. So generally, um, it I kind of showed you an example there, but the general framework for any sort of meta prompting is going to be define the the profile and the limitations. So that kind of goes back to your impact assessment when you're doing your ideation, making sure you specify what the model, what the uh, bot or the solution is going to be capable of, what um, its limitations are, what its restricted use cases are, then specifying the output format. Um, so for example, in one use case, you might want something more conversational. In another use case, maybe you're doing something more along um, like writing code, um, making sure that you're specifying what that output would be. Then the third is providing examples on how it should interact with a user. So um, if you, it kind of goes back to the output as well. If you wanted the, the solution to come out with a, a certain format of output, um, by giving it examples, it helps the, the model say, okay, this is how I need to format my response. Um, and then of course, making sure we put any sort of other safety guardrails into this. The, this meta prompt framework is gonna be relevant to other parts of the, the standards um, that I'll go through as well. Um, but I think it's the most relevant for the impact assessment and the accountability piece of this because the, the meta prompt framework is really how we ensure that, that accountability when we're developing these solutions. So onto the second um, standard um, or goal as a part of the standard, um, making sure we're transparent of what the system can do um, and how well it can do it. And so it's a, a best practice as a part of the solution that you say, maybe you have the bot introduce itself or in the, in the application, um, you, say, you say, this is generated by um, a large language model 
And so there's going to be inconsistencies in the response. Um, you could see that most of our Microsoft solutions will do that out of the box. If you're using Copilot or Bing Chat Enterprise, it will always say, you know, this, your responses are generated by large language models. So know that um, there may be inconsistencies. May, that informs the user, first of all, makes it transparent that they are talking to a bot and not a real human, but also make sure that they are staying aware of um, what the response is and potentially um, double checking that if um, something doesn't look correct. Um, and then also understanding how clear um, or how well the system can do what it can do. So within the, the Azure space, we actually have the ability to evaluate your models. And so you can give it a set of responses uh, or, or a set of questions and the um, expected responses. And then you can generate the responses, um, what the model comes out with and essentially score it and see how well it did. So this is one way that we can kind of calculate um, how well the model does. Um, other folks might have other ways that they want to evaluate this. You don't necessarily have to use uh, what we have available in Azure, but this has been a pretty um, tested out way to, um, to have a numerical answer of, okay, this is 85% accurate, or this is 70 or 65% accurate. So maybe we shouldn't even deploy this yet, right? Um, but just making sure you have some way to to benchmark your queries and say, uh, this is how well the model does. Let me just check for any questions real quick. Yes, agree that responsible AI um, is also, you need to have full transparency on where the answers are coming from. Um, and so that kind of goes back to um, like when you provide that brief inter introduction and saying, you know, the, this is what this is capable of, maybe even saying this is the data that we're pulling from. Um, I always like having the, um, the annotations of this is the source of the information just so that the user that's interacting with the system can always has that option to go back I found uh, particularly, I write a lot of Python code, and if I use um, Bing Chat Enterprise, sometimes it will give me the, the wrong answer of the code. Um, and then if I click the annotations, I realize it came from Stack Overflow, and it generated the answer off of code that didn't work because someone put it in Stack Overflow to figure out why it wasn't working. And so having that sort of transparency of where the data is coming from is very important as a part of this standard. Feel free to add other questions um, in the chat window. Um, I think you can even raise your hand and come off mute if you have anything. But moving on to fairness, um, this is understanding the, the biases um, and how fair our systems are. Um, and so there's kind of two ways I recommend combating fairness um, or helping with fairness. Um, one is uh, called a bias audit, um, and other folks might call it other things, but essentially it's to try, try to identify some of the potential areas of bias um, based off the different personas that might be using the system. And going back to your evaluation of your models, making sure you're developing test cases around those different areas of bias and analyzing the outputs or analyzing the, the accuracy of those outputs. So something I like to refer to, um, this is on Wikipedia, it's called the Cognitive Bias Index. And I know this probably is hard to, to read. I'll put the, the link in the chat window. But essentially, this outlines all the different types of human biases there could potentially be. Um, it's kind of this comprehensive list. Um, it, it's around 
human judgment, decision making, um, errors, fallacies, um, irrational beliefs. I think some of the more relevant ones um, when it comes to responsible AI, one is anchoring bias. So this is the tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information offered when making a decision. Um, so this can really affect um, the generative AI models or the outputs by making them dependent on the initial input prompt or data while ignoring some of the um, underlying factors or less weighted factors. Um, so example of this might be in your prompt, um, you may say something with a bias yourself. Um, maybe I'm asking about how to create a, um, a marketing campaign. And I, I keep it very general, but because I work at a nonprofit, I know my marketing campaign is more geared towards like a, a, a societal impact use case, right? Um, but then something like ChatGPT is going to take from all the marketing campaigns in the world, and maybe there's more marketing campaigns in uh, the healthcare industry than there is in the humanitarian industry. So it might give me an example that's more um, specific to a different um, a different uh, sector entirely. And so that's where the anchoring bias might be important to for you as a user to understand, but also you as the developer of the system to understand so that you know that, okay, it's going to have a tendency to lean this way or lean that way. Um, because of the information that it's given. So let me make sure I met a prompt and I add those guardrails as a part of this development process um, to um, make sure that it doesn't lean a certain way. So that's the cognitive bias. I could talk about this for a whole hour itself, <laughs> but um, I can, I'll put that in the chat window uh, once I'm done talking here. The other thing I want to highlight is that Microsoft uh, research came out with the AI fairness checklist. And so similar to the impact assessment, it kind of gives you a list of questions, a checklist to kind of go through and make sure that you're developing more fair AI products and services. So moving forward with uh, the reliability and safety, um, I like to talk about the Belmont report, which is um, it's a document that came out back in 1979, and it was specific to conducting research around the biomedical and behavioral research space. Um, and the core idea uh, that came from the Belmont re report was that we want to protect the autonomy of individuals that may not have um, full autonomy. So they use the example of prisoners. Is it fair to test vaccinations on prisoners when they have diminished aut autonomy? I like to still use this as a, a principle when I'm developing AI solutions um, because it still kind of holds true. We can think about um, how can we make sure that generative AI solutions respect the autonomy, the dignity, and the rights of the individuals that are using this. I think about this a lot in the humanitarian space, right? When we're working with um, individuals that might have diminished autonomy, how do we make sure that our AI solutions are respecting their autonomy? Um, then I, I know I'm going to be a little short on time here, so I'm going to try to go a little quicker, but um, we do have some content filtering and content safety tools that are available for you to use. Um, they help with text moderation, tech image, multimodal content moderation to help detect if there's um, harmful information um, within the prompts that are sent to the model or um, as a part of the data that you're using um, to respond with. And then um, I always recommend reviewing our acceptable use policies. Um, especially in the healthcare space and the religious space, we've kind of outlined what is okay, what is not okay. Um, and so it allows you as a part of your kind of envisioning um, to say, you know, this is what we are allowed to do with these systems. 
I also want to highlight um, a few pieces of that. So like um, making sure that you're not impacting an individual's legal position, financial position, life opportunities, employment opportunities, human rights, um, physical or psychological in uh, injury. Um, I think this is really important to highlight for the nonprofit sector because a lot of us are trying to help people um, in a lot of these different um, aspects. Uh, we or all of our goal here is to make an impact on humans, and so um, just make sure that you're kind of going through our code of conduct and making sure that your use case that you're developing is not uh, violating any of these. I'm going to skip a few slides here, but um, I think we should be able to send out the whole deck afterwards. Just a little bit about privacy and security. Once again, this is a topic I could talk a whole hour on as well, but um, this is a shared responsibility between you and Microsoft when you're using our services. And so, of course, like when you're storing your data on our platform, we have an amount of security that we're doing to make sure that your data is not exposed to other customers' data. Um, we, we always say Microsoft runs on trust. Um, your data is encrypted um, at rest. It's encrypted in transit. Um, your data is not used to train the underlying model, um, and it, it's protected by um, all of our um, typical um, security controls, um, but it's a joint responsibility in that um, if I go back here, there is going to be local legislation. Um, I know that um, just I think two months ago, Biden came out with some AI legislation um, or executive order, but basically um, he was stating kind of the responsible use of AI for the US. And this, this is gonna to continue to evolve. Microsoft will stay on top of it as a provider, but then as you use the model, there are gonna be parts that you need to control as well. We won't know whether the your user is sitting in, um, let's say, um, the UK where we need to deal with GDPR versus sitting in California. And so there's that responsibility where when you're developing your application, you need to understand who your users are, understand where their data may reside um, if you choose to store that data. Um, because we, it, we're providing the tools to you but then you are putting those tools together and you, you're you the expert of, of how this is all be, being put together and being used. And then finally, um, I'll talk about um, inclusiveness. Um, so this is how do we make applications easier to use for all human beings? Um, and this is a little bit kind of meta of using AI for inclusive AI. Um, but before any of these open AI models even existed, Microsoft has been working on some of these um, accessibility um, AI solutions for a long, long time. And these are more point solutions. Um, so for example, text-to-speech, we have a number of different neural voice models that allow you to do text-to-speech. So if I'm someone, um, that um, is visually impaired or is difficult for me to read text. This is an easy way that you can add inclusivity into your application. Similar, similarly, speech to text, if I am visually impaired um, and need help being able to um, input text, it, uh, we provide a model that makes it easier for someone to instead uh, use their own speech and um, put that into text. 
we have an option called immersive reader as well. And so this is specific more so, I would say, to the education sector. If you're doing anything around um, educating people, especially where um, they're learning a new language or they might have some learning differences, we have this that is a pre-built model um, to help improve inclusivity into an application. We have AI vision, which I'll kind of just show you this example. Um, this helps um, kind of detect images within um, within a, a picture. And so this is kind of what we use as a part of, part of the content safety as well, um, where we have the, um, the image, image content filtering. We essentially use this, but you have other applications that you could use that for. Um, and then finally, translation. So um, I know most of your nonprofits are operating globally, and we support a, about 130 languages, making sure that all of your constituents, um, no matter what language they may speak, are able to interact with your organization effectively. So kind of with that, I think I'm right on time and I apologize I didn't leave too much time for questions, but I can I can stay on for a little bit. Um, some of the resources that I talked about today, the impact assessment, um, you can get the full um, responsible AI standard um, online. Um, this goes through those responsible AI standards that I talked about a bit more in depth. We have the Hacks Toolkit, which is uh, more on the UI UX side. So if you wanted something to help um, guide how to actually um, create that transparency in your application and show the user, okay, this is, this is like how um, you're interacting with AI right now. This is a really place, a good place to go. We have the Responsible AI Dashboard, which kind of helps um, you operationalize on Responsible AI. This is available in Azure. Um, this is the executive order that I uh, referred to that um, we follow most of this. I read through this and it, our guidelines are pretty much in line with what he says, but um, it's always good to stay on top of the news. Um, and then we're continuously developing more and more things um, as a part of our engineering practices um, for you to use um, as a part of your development processes. So with that, I thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any further questions. Um, I'm happy to help. Thank you. Anushka, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I think it's really important that we as an organization that is obviously investing really big, not only in the nonprofit sector, but also in AI, is able to help de-risk some of these decisions that you at the nonprofits are making each and every day. So uh, please reach out. Uh, let us know if you want to have a follow-up, subsequent personalized discussion with your organization or others at the organization. Um, there's a plethora of resources that are available to you as part of Tech for Social Impact, and that's why our team exists, to make sure to uh, to educate and uh, to ensure that all of these resources that you're entitled to um, are brought to bear. So Anushka, thank you again so much. Amazing presentation. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. We'll get the recording out by end of week and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all.